morning. Morning. Thank you, Candy, for that song. Yes, thank you. She came and sang it before the first service, too. Um, so we're really thankful for her singing that. It's a good reminder why we're here, right? Yes. Jesus is not just our Lord, he's not just our King, but he's also our friend. And all our burdens, we can bring to him. And as the song talks about, we have many trials and temptations in this world. And I'm thankful that you're here today. Because I know there is a trial and temptation also to sometimes not come to church. And I know we're in a different time now. Some people are staying because they have different health issues and coming isn't safe for them. That's why we're filming right now. So if you're at home, good morning, you too, or good evening whenever you're watching this. Um, but you're here. And I do pray that this time will be a time of solace for you. That you can give your burdens to him. Knowing that he hears your prayers and that he's coming to you today through his word. And I pray that you can find time after the service to interact and share and encourage each other with some words of blessing. Uh, for announcements before the service, uh, we do have a vote today. So it's a voters meeting. Uh, hopefully you got a ballot. If you didn't. On the way in or on the way out, if you didn't get one, you should be able to find blue uh, ballot paper. Uh, it's on the greeter's desk. I think there may even be some on the offering desk right now. Uh, go ahead and vote. It's for the bylaws uh, that are being changed to our Constitution. Uh, it's been, those have been in work for a long time, but it's time to vote for them. Also, we have two new elders that have been elected. Um, we need approval for them to be elders. So please do that. And final announcement is that for next week, uh, no one has signed up for a sanitation team. We're still sanitizing the sanctuary after the first service. So I know you're second service people, but if you would like to come in early or go to the first service next week, we can still use some people. There has been a question about, well, what do I do if I sign up? Um, Roy Zingrich, front row, right here. Um, he is kind of a point person. He can tell you where the supplies are for cleaning for that if you would like to volunteer. Um, pray about it. Think about it. If you don't sign up today on the way out, you can contact me or Roy during the week, and we'll, we'll get you set up. Um, so with that, I do welcome you to stand as we open. This isn't necessarily a praise song. This is more of a confessional song. Made it, uh, confessing our sins to the Lord. <laughs> Confess before God and one another 
that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to the life of God. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a servant of the Lord, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Testament reading for the 15th Sunday after Pentecost is Genesis 50 verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am, am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is Romans 14, 1-12. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems, esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, observes it in the honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in the armor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord, and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this and Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, 
As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the gospel of the Lord. And I invite you now together to confess the faith that we share through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died and was buried. He descended into the hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen.
Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Two days ago, we observed the 19th anniversary of what is known simply by the date, 9-11. And so on September 11, 2001, 19 members of a terrorist group hijacked four commercial passenger jet airlines. They intentionally crashed two of them into the twin towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, killing everyone on board. Both buildings collapsed within a matter of a couple of hours, destroying nearby buildings and claiming nearly 3,000 lives. A third airliner was crashed by the hijackers into the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. And the fourth plane, airliner, that uh, was hijacked was crashed into a field near Shanksville in rural Pennsylvania after some passengers and members of the crew attempted to take back control of the plane. There was no survivors from any of those four flights. And many of us were glued to our TV sets and saw the collapse of the World Trade Center as it happened. And it certainly is a sight that many of us will never forget. A few years ago, my wife and our oldest son and I uh, went to the memorial that was put in place at the Pentagon. And it was deeply moving to see the remembrance that had been put together for those who died there. That didn't receive nearly the publicity of the Twin Towers in New York City, but there were a number of people who died there as well. And almost all of the people who died in that terrorist act were civilians. They were not military. This past week on Friday, early Friday morning, I read something in just a brief news clip about a woman whose husband had died in the Twin Towers of New York City 19 years earlier. And she said, basically, this was her message. It had taken a long time, but finally she had come to the point of being able to forgive those who were responsible for the death of her husband. She said it was not easy, and it did not happen quickly. But finally, it was like a tremendous weight off her shoulders when she was finally able to offer forgiveness to those who had caused her so much pain. That's what I'd like to share with you this morning. Forgiveness. Forgiveness in Christ. And I want to start off by saying simply this, that forgiveness is never easy. It just isn't. It is a hard thing to do. For a lot of people, it's even difficult for them to accept the forgiveness that is freely offered by God. But it is surely extremely difficult for people who have been deeply hurt, as was that woman who lost her husband on 9-11. It is especially difficult for such people to be able to forgive someone has brought them so much pain and suffering. And so, to our text for this morning from Matthew chapter 18, we hear those words of Peter when he came to the point of wondering how in the world he should determine the number of times to forgive someone who has sinned against him. And so I'd like to share with you something that came out of a book entitled Mistreated, written by Ron V. Davis. In it, he tells about a millionaire who owned a lot in an exclusive residential neighborhood of a large city. And this lot that he owned presented a rather unusual problem because it was only a couple of yards wide, but it was 100 feet long. And so there was very little that he could do with such an oddly proportioned piece of real estate. What he figured he could do, about the only thing he could do, is to sell it to one of the neighbors on either side. And so he went to the first neighbor on the east side of his lot, 
And he asked if he was interested in buying it. And the neighbor said, well, I do that, but only as a favor to you. And then he offered him a ridiculously low price. The millionaire was absolutely exploding with anger. He said, why, that's not even one-tenth of what this lot is worth. And so he stormed out and he went to the neighbor on the west side. And to his dismay, that neighbor on the west side bettered the previous offer by only two dollars. And the neighbor said rather smugly, look, I've got you over a barrel. You can't sell that lot to anyone else and you can't build on it, so there's my offer, take it or leave it. The millionaire was absolutely consumed with rage, and so within a few days he hired an architect and a contractor to build one of the strangest houses ever conceived. Five feet wide and running the full hundred feet long of the property, his house was little more than a row of tiny rooms, each barely able to accommodate just one piece of furniture. The neighbors complained about it, but the city said there was nothing they could do. And so when it was finished, the millionaire moved into his uncomfortable and rather impractical house, and there he stayed until his death. And the house became known in the neighborhood as Spike House. And I read that it still stands today as a monument to one man's hate and anger. Spike House. Can't help but wonder. How many people are living today in spite house because they find themselves consumed by anger and find that they cannot, simply cannot forgive the ones who have hurt them. So Peter asks Jesus, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? Pretty relevant question, it seems to me. I kind of wonder, you know, what had gone on in Peter's life that brought him to asking that question? And I wonder if he had been hurt, and maybe he had forgiven someone a couple of times already, maybe even three, which would have been the prescribed number of times that you should forgive. But I can imagine him asking himself, so do I keep submitting myself to someone else's abuse in order to maintain a relationship? And for how long? Kind of an important question. But I'd like to deal with this particular question this morning on the basis of our text. When someone has done a wrong to me, when they have hurt me and caused me pain, why is it important for me to forgive them? And the first thing that comes to mind is this. First of all, it is healthy for me to forgive. It is healthy for me to forgive. And so when I forgive someone, it is not just for their sake, but it is for my own. Someone has said that when you nurture resentment in your heart and fail to forgive, and while your home's sulking, that person is out dancing. It's true. When we say, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget, Somehow we think that our resentment is hurting the other person when, generally speaking, it is only devouring us. I was interested in an article that appeared in USA Today not so terribly long ago. It was entitled, Psychologists Now Know What Makes People Happy. And the article reported the findings of the University of Michigan professor Christopher Peterson. What Peterson discovered was that forgiveness is a single behavior most strongly linked to happiness. Did you hear that? It's amazing. Forgiveness is a behavior most strongly linked to happiness. And he went on to explain that without that, there's going to be something lacking in the quality and satisfaction of life that people experience. There's going to be something lacking for you and for me 
if we simply refuse to forgive a brother or sister who has sinned against us. And that's one reason that Jesus emphasized to his followers that they must really learn to forgive because forgiveness and happiness really do go hand in hand. And so Jesus tells them a parable. In order to fully answer Peter's question, Jesus told a parable about a servant who owed his master 10,000 talents. And I want to mention that when we forgive, we, or we do forgive in the second place because the past is past. And as Jesus answers Peter's question, he tells this parable about a servant who owed his master 10,000 talents and about another servant who owed the first uh, simply 100 denarii. It's a little bit uh, foggy as to how much that would be in today's dollars. I read, read a number of interpretations of it that put the sum of 10,000 talents in the range of 12 to 20 million dollars. And so that first servant, his, even if he was given a generous installment plan of repayment, had no hope whatsoever of being able to repay that debt. A hundred denarii, the numbers that I read about, uh, put that as one day's wages up to a couple of months wages perhaps, but still a vast difference between the two sons. And so the first servant had a man who owed him that hundred denarii, and uh, whatever that would have amounted to, he refused to let this man out of the debt, even though he had already been forgiven the debt of 10,000 talents. And so when the master heard about that, he was absolutely furious. This wicked servant had been forgiven all of that huge sum of money that he had no hope of repaying, and now he refused to forgive someone else what might have been as little as a day's wages. And Jesus' point was clear. The master is God, and we are the servants. And so thirdly, we want to recognize this. The most important reason for us to forgive is because we have been forgiven. We forgive because we have been forgiven. Dwight Moody once said that Peter did not seem to think that he was in danger of falling into sin. His question was, how often should I forgive my brother? But very soon, we hear that Peter has fallen. And Moody says, I can imagine that when he did fall, when he denied his Lord, a sweet thought came to him of what his master had said. That being, that he had forgiven him much, and therefore he would be forgiven by our Lord. I appreciate the fact that uh, C.S. Lewis had something to say about this whole matter of forgiveness. <coughs> C.S. Lewis made a real distinction between excusing someone and forgiving them. He said, if someone jostles me when, when I'm walking and accidentally I drop my books, I excuse that because it didn't hurt me much and it was unintended. But if a person does something to injure me, or my family, and the hurt will go on hurting for years, I can't excuse it. I have only the option of forgiving or not forgiving. As I mentioned before, forgiving is not easy. When someone has really hurt us in a significant way, not that accidental of Johnson, but when someone has really inflicted pain on me, it's difficult. And over the years, I've known a number of people who have really struggled with that. One that I recall uh, vividly from years ago is a woman whose granddaughter had died. And because uh, the mother of that granddaughter lived in a city far away, it was her grandmother who made the funeral arrangements for her. And shortly before the funeral service, uh, this woman 
was up in years, maybe as old as me, or a little bit older, came to me and said, Pastor, I have a request for you. I don't think my daughter, the granddaughter's mother, I don't think she's coming to the funeral, but if she should, she is not to be allowed to come in. Can you imagine that? Apparently, this woman and her daughter, and I knew nothing of their relationship before the day of uh, the granddaughter's funeral, had had difficulty in getting along for years and years, and there's one thing that stuck especially in this grandmother's mind. And she simply said, I don't want to see her, I don't want to talk to her, I don't want her to be here for my granddaughter's funeral. Well, with uh, just a few minutes to go before the funeral service, it didn't seem like it was the ideal time to go into a discussion with her about all the reasons that Jesus might have to say about forgiveness. But afterwards, after a few days had passed, I had the opportunity to speak to her again. I shared with her some of what Jesus said, including that portion of the Lord's Prayer, you know, that we pray every Sunday in worship. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And in effect, what we are saying is, God, I want you to forgive me in the same way that I forgive other people. Maybe we ought to keep our mouth shut when we come to that petition in the Lord's Prayer. If we are lacking in that determination to forgive those who have wronged us, who have caused us hurt. It's a terrible thing to live uh, in the past, to be unable to bring about that forgiveness for another person. And friends in Christ, I want to tell you that just in my own personal experience, and I know it would be validated by uh, other people as well, that the only way, the only way that I can possibly forgive someone who has hurt me is with God helping me to do this. With the Holy Spirit so working in my heart and in my mind, I am brought to a spirit of forgiveness by which I can offer that to others. That's the only way it can happen. Because our sinful nature always has in mind that spirit of resentment and anger that simply will not go away by our own efforts. It is only with God's help that it can happen. I heard about a married couple that really had a problem with forgiveness. They had a lot of sharp disagreements. Yet somehow the wife always seemed to be able to stay calm and collected. And so one day her husband commented on his wife's restraint and he said, when I get mad at you, he said, you never fight back. How do you control your anger? And his wife said, I work it off by cleaning the toilet. And her husband asked, well, how does that help? And she said, I use your toothbrush. <laughs> maybe there is a spirit of forgiveness lacking there <laughs> not just maybe there surely was when you and I have been forgiven such a huge amount of sin just think about it just, just think about the tremendous cost that God paid for our forgiveness the life of his son life of his son, that huge mountain of sin that has separated us from God, and God freely and eagerly forgives us. And so it is right that we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's a tremendous thing. It's a freeing thing to be able to get that burden of resentment, of anger, off of our shoulders. We are freed from that. Did you notice in the Old Testament reading this morning from Genesis chapter 50? Joseph. If you haven't read through that whole account, I'd encourage you to go to the book of Genesis and just read through all of those chapters that describe 
what Joseph's brothers have done to him over the years and how Joseph endured with God's help through all of that time and now when they are to be reunited Joseph is able to give the assurance to his brothers that they are forgiven even though they treated him so badly ending in him being sold into slavery and yet he forgave them it would be my prayer for each one of us here this morning if there is any spirit of resentment that we hold in our hearts if there is any painful remembrance that we have about someone hurting us that by the spirit's power we would be brought to that spirit of forgiveness that we might extend to others helping ourselves allowing the past to be the past and reflecting the great love that God has for us that moved him to forgive us for Jesus' sake. May God grant that to us, that we would not live in the house of spite, but live in the freedom of the gospel. May he grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. And now the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. For the prayers of the church today, there have been many prayer requests submitted uh, throughout this week and even last week, um, most of them asking that we pray on Sunday for these uh, people. So I want to share the prayer request before praying just so that no one's thrown off guard by anything know what we're praying about. Uh, Marty and Sherry Zero, uh, Sherry that asked for this prayer, their granddaughter, Katie, um, needs, needs prayer. And so if you can pray for Katie, their granddaughter, just keep her in your prayers for a while now. Uh, Sherry said that she has shared some of Katie's issues with some members of the congregation in the past, but she's at a point now where she's getting help for her needs. And so Sherry wants us to pray that she can keep going through the therapy that she needs uh, for healing, uh, both in her mind and body. So do pray for Katie. Uh, George Elkham is still in hospice care, as is Paul Money, who is Darlene Money's brother-in-law. So we want to pray for both of them in hospice care. We continue to pray for Rachel Blust and Tracy Philpi, both recovering from surgeries. Rachel did have one this past week. I haven't heard how the checkup went on Friday. Um, we want to keep praying for both of them. Uh, there's been a prayer request submitted by uh, Sandra Sanders uh, for her son's father-in-law, Pat Brown. Uh, Pat Brown uh, likely has cancer, but it's not definitive yet. He has a test this week. Um, and then uh, exploratory surgery scheduled for the end of the month already. So we want to pray for him. Um, and he's from what I hear, a regular at our family dinners. So many of you may know him, even though he's not a member of the church. So we want to pray for Pat Brown. Also, Betty Ann Hill. Um, Paul Droughts was her pastor for a while. And so he has asked us to keep praying for her. She's been diagnosed with leukemia. Um, on a more of a positive note, um, new life for the Mahoney family. A friend of Sam's from high school, I believe it was, right, Sam? Yes. So his name's Shane, new life in their family. He's a granddad now, so I asked to pray for pray for him being a granddad. Also, uh, I don't know the details, but I heard Sherry Zero is going to the emergency room this morning, so we can just pray for her, too. Um, don't know if that's 100% true, but it's what I've heard, so we're going to pray for her something about stomach pain, so the, the Lord knows um, what her health issue is. We'll, we'll pray for her there as well. Also, many requests have come in from various people um, to pray for those that are in our West Coast, suffering from fires, as well as um, Louisiana from the hurricane that just hit recently, but also in the news, Jeff Foss said he heard there may be another hurricane coming in. Um, so just we'll keep those people in our prayers. Uh, with that, I, I invite you to stand. Uh, we'll go before the Lord with these prayers.
Almighty God, as once you kept Joseph from evil and brought good from his suffering in Egypt, deliver us by your grace so that we may learn patience in our trials. Teach us to be slow to judge, quick to forgive, and steadfast in love for you and for one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, you've shown great compassion to us. Teach us to show such compassion to others, that we may welcome the stranger, love our neighbor in need, and be attentive to those new to the faith or vulnerable to temptation. Help us to serve the refugees seeking safety and give us opportunity to share your gifts with those who live in poverty and need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, bless those who preach and teach your word and give the hearers willing ears to hear and willing hearts to learn the scriptures well. Bless those currently training to be pastors in our seminaries, and we ask that you would continue to raise up pastors within your church. We ask that you would give wisdom and courage to our elected and appointed leaders, that they may pursue justice, seek peace, and protect life from its natural beginning to its natural end. Bring an end to the threats of terror and violence among our people, and, uh, and we ask, Lord, that you would open all nations to the voice of your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord, lead us to pursue reconciliation, that we may stand before you forgiven and united in faith. Give us unity of doctrine and help us to walk together in harmony of life. Prepare us to receive your own son's body and blood in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Father, body and soul, give to the troubled and mind your peace, to the suffering relief, to the sick healing, to the grieving comfort, and deliver the dying into everlasting life. Here is especially for Katie. We pray that she would continue in her therapy, that it would work healing for her body and mind. And Lord, we pray that she would turn to you, as Sherry has requested us to ask, that she would dig into you and your word and your support during this time for healing. For you are the ultimate physician. Lord, we lift up George Elkham and Paul Money. We pray, Lord, for healing in their body and comfort. We pray that you would bring your, their family around them to love them and support them in this time, that your word would be proclaimed to them, that they would have peace in their soul, knowing that you are their Savior. We continue to lift up Rachel and Tracy. We pray for healing in their body from the surgeries that they've had, that um, the surgeries seem, for the most part, to have been successful, but we pray for a final success, Lord, for both of them, and that in your will there would be complete healing. We also lift up to you, Pat Brown. We pray in the name of Jesus that the test this next week would show that he doesn't have cancer, if that is your will, Lord. We pray, though, that during this time we this test, that he would have peace in his mind. And that if the results say cancer this week, that um, you would help us as a body support him. Um, and thank you that his family has requested that we pray for him. We lift up Betty Ann Hill. We pray for her battle with leukemia. That you would strengthen her. That you would turn her to trust you in the path ahead. We also um, pray for all those that we've named in our hearts. We want to pray for those that we don't know personally that are suffering in our West Coast from the fires, as well as those that are suffering from the recent hurricane and the one that is um, expected to potentially hit again. We pray, Lord, that your will be done and that the people in our whole nation would turn to you in repentance. 
knowing that you are above all and in control of all and can help us where we cannot help ourselves. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, you're the giver of life, and we thank you for the lives of those members of our church body with birthdays this week, the lives of Todd Orshawski, for Marilyn Hoffman, for Nick Oberhoy, for Logan Dan, for George Elkham, for Stephen Blust, and for John Niemeyer. We also thank you for the new life in the Mahoney family. We pray for Shane that you would lift him up as a granddad and help him be a great granddad. We also lift up Linda and Michael Donovitz and their wedding anniversary this week. We pray that your son Jesus would be at the center of their marriage and continue to lead them through this life together. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We thank you um, for our church council and for our constitution and the bylaws that we have. We pray for the vote that we're about to have, that the bylaws would be um, approved and that it would be helpful for our congregation. We lift up to you, Lord, um, the new elders on the ballot. We pray that they would be accepted by the congregation and that they would be able to lead faithfully for us um, in their role as elder. And we stand before you asking all these things boldly through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And Lord, teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And receive this good word. The Lord blesses you and keeps you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and is gracious unto you. The Lord lifts up his countenance upon you and he gives you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.